Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg on 720 WGN. My guest tonight, John McAdams. I teach a course uh, at Marquette about the Kennedy assassination, and uh, there's certain kind of logical puzzles that come up over and over, certain uh, kinds of questions that come up over and over. Uh, and I basically, uh, when I outlined the book, I thought, you know, well, hey, this thing comes up over and over, and that thing comes up over and over. Uh, and they're similar intellectual problems. Um, uh, for example, um, conspiracy books will often show people a piece of evidence that conflicts with the Warren Commission report. Uh, like, for example, there was a witness named Lillian Mooneyham uh, who was in the county records building, Caddy Corner, across uh, Elm and Houston uh, from the Texas School Book Depository. And four and a half minutes to five minutes, she said, after the assassination, she saw a figure, a person in the sniper's nest window. Uh, she couldn't see the face that he was back a bit. Now Oswald was long gone out of the building by that time and the cops didn't get up there until 30 minutes after the assassination so the obvious inference must be aha she saw a conspirator. Um, believing that uh, however uh, means you have to not ask the question is it really plausible that a shooter who shot Kennedy a conspiracy shooter would, hang would just hang around yeah. for four and a half and five, just lollygag in the sniper's yeah. nest um, and when you ask that question uh, you start thinking now, wait a minute could she have been mistaken if you know much about witness testimony uh, and uh, a lot of people don't know much about witness testimony unfortunately often including juries uh, yeah. The curious thing about uh, all the years since 48 years ago this very day uh, is that there's been such a proliferation of different conspiracy theories about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And even though lots of expert uh, uh, analysts, uh, that uh, Posner, Jerry Posner, did a fine book on it. We appeared on this program years ago. Others have done such books. You've done one, which also basically leads you to considerable skepticism about any of the available conspiracy theories, but they're still coining new conspiracy theories. <laughs> Why this one has attracted and has, has somehow ignited so much continued conspiratorial projection is in itself, and for a social psychologist, a very fascinating question. It's a question I uh, look for you to respond to right after we pause for a quick round of commercials. Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg on 720 WGN. And we return directly to John McAdams, professor of political science at Marquette University in Milwaukee. And the question I was throwing at you a moment ago is a basic one from a, the point of view of socio-psychological uh, interest or confusion. Why so many uh, theories of the Kennedy assassination, why does it persist after uh, uh, 48 years when most of the hard evidentiary and uh, analytic work suggests that, no, no, it was a sole shooter? Well, first, why so many theories? Because the evidence simply does not add up and converge upon any one conspiracy theory. Uh, so people are all over the place. Uh, they'll grab this little bit of evidence here, this little bit of evidence there, and there is a little bit of a premium in coming up with a new conspiracy theory. As uh, for why did the same thing happen after any of the other successful, in quotes, presidential assassinations? Um, I'm not sure. I do know that there is a, uh, uh, there was sort of a chronic, uh, uh, with, after the Lincoln assassination, uh, yes, some conspirators were caught, were hanged in yeah, prison. Yeah, we know about that. But uh, there was talk that maybe other people in Washington, uh, maybe some high officials in government might have been behind it. That was a, a bit of a rumor. It's never been, never been proved, never been much evidence. There was such a rumor with regard to the Kennedy assassination, and there was even a woman who did a play, a satiric but bitter play, suggesting... McBird? McBird, exactly. Yeah. I forget her name, but the suggestion was that LBJ, the vice president, arranged for the death of yeah, the president. Yeah, of course, a play on Macbeth, yeah. Uh, to be sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, as for, again, the uh, psychological resonance, uh, you know, as I said 
people were simply shocked because they thought that sort of thing didn't uh, didn't happen. Uh, there's the glamour uh, of, uh, of John Kennedy, and for that matter, his wife and his entire family. People could identify with them. Yeah. Uh, as you can imagine, the assassination of, say, Malcolm X uh, or the shooting of George Wallace didn't have such resonance because they weren't uh, particularly admired figures. Uh, there's also the fact that in certain ways, uh, the JFK assassination appeared to be a kind of watershed in American life where America sort of lost its innocence because people remember the Vietnam War ramping up, uh, a civil rights movement that in 63 the majority of Americans could get behind uh, seemed to degenerate into all of a sudden you had Stokely Carmichael, you had Eldridge Cleaver preaching violence, you had riots in the cities, uh, and of course over, over all of that was the Vietnam War. So when you put it all together, it sort of seems like a, a, a watershed that things turned for the worse after that. I don't think there was any causality there. Uh, but people, people tend to, as you know, as a psychologist, people tend to see causality yeah. when a cold heart analysis would say no. Here's one uh, conspiracy theory voiced by its inventor, I guess. His name is Tom Wilson. And this is one particular theory, and I used to be fairly conversant in them. We've done many programs with authors who either assert one or another conspiracy theory. Jim Garrison was on this program, as was uh, the cousin of... Um, of Mrs. Kennedy, uh, namely uh, John Davis, okay. who's one of the great theorists uh, asserting that the mafia killed Kennedy mm -hmm. and so on. We've had all of that. We've had Posner here more than once. But here's a guy. So I, I know a lot of this stuff, but this one really astonishes me. I hadn't known about this particular reconstruction of the event. Tom Wilson. Uh, we shall hear from him right now. When I came back and took these coordinates, which were mapped out using the machinery, not manual calculation, I could never put President Kennedy at the spot where the Zapruder film said it was frame 313 when Badge Man was firing. Because the projectile trajectory from Badge Man wasn't where Kennedy was. And when I put President Kennedy down the road four feet further, when Badge Man could hit him, Mary Moreland was in the wrong location, Mr. Zapruder wasn't fit. The fence was in the wrong place. I could not make anything fit. So I had to go back to Dallas, and I had to run more tests. And what I found out was something that I had overlooked all this time in looking at the photograph. President Kennedy's wound in his right temporal area is at an angle like this. It's coming out of the ground. And I said to myself, Tom, if the bullet was coming out of the ground, how is this possible? Because I never tried to determine where the bullet came from. I only know what it did to President Kennedy's head. This totally bewildered me that I'm at the end of this mission. President Kennedy was assassinated by a man firing a missile from inside the manhole cover at the bottom of the steps in Dealey Plaza. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that that is exactly where that headshot came from. Now, who is this fellow, Tom Wilson? Uh, uh, Tom Wilson is a fellow uh, who, uh, for example, enhances photographs and finds evidence of conspiracy. In one famous case, he uh, uh, got a frame of, of the Zapruder film, enhanced it electronically. Uh, you, you know, you can put something into a computer and do all kinds of things with it, uh, and found out uh, that there was a bullet hole in the front of John Kennedy's jacket, which would indicate a shot from in front. There was just a little bit of a problem with that, however. John Kennedy's jacket still exists. It's in the National Archives, uh, and it has no bullet hole in it. So he's in enhancing photographic evidence <laughs> and finding things that really uh, just, uh, just aren't there. Um, I hate to be unkind, but it's kind of a crackpot. And lots of crackpots uh, jumped in on this one, didn't they? Yeah. I don't know how many people actually jumped in on Wilson. I do know uh, that when Nigel Turner, uh, the uh, British producer who did The Men Who Killed Kennedy, uh, when he came out with a, a, one of his uh, videos in the 1990s, he featured uh, Tom Wilson. Um, this so, is from uh, that film, I, I gather. Uh, could right. be. No. I don't exactly remember it, but it definitely could be. Come to Jim Garrison and the... Uh, and Clay Shaw was the accused murderer or organizer of the plot uh, that successfully killed Kennedy. Uh, uh, 
Jim Garrison. He was then the district attorney of... Of Orleans Parish, of Louisiana. Orleans Parish, yeah. Orleans Parish Louisiana. Um, Garrison had all kinds of odd ideas going uh, through his mind. Um, it all started uh, with a fellow named Dean Andrews, uh, who in Warren Commission testimony said he'd gotten a call on the weekend of the assassination uh, from a Clay Bertrand. Okay, that he should go to Dallas and represent Lee Harvey Oswald, and that's in Warren Commission testimony. So um, uh, Garrison decided he was going to figure out who Clay Bertrand was. Uh, in January of 1967, he told Richard Billings, who was from Life Magazine and there with him, that, uh, oh, uh, Clay Bertrand is um, Clay Shaw, but I don't think that matters, okay? because his key suspect at the time was a fellow named David Ferry. That's the Joe Pesci character mm-hmm. in the movie D- JFK. Uh, then Ferry died. Died. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, Clay Shaw was front and center uh, uh, as the suspect. There, he was a prominent businessman. Yeah, yeah. He ran the International Trade uh, yeah. International uh, tr- uh, Trademark, a very important civic figure in New Orleans, also led the restoration of the French Quarter. Uh, so he was an important uh, 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 civic figure. Uh, he was also gay, and Garrison started out w- thinking that the Kennedy assassination must have been a homosexual thrill killing, as he put it. But then a lot of assassination buffs flooded into New Orleans, uh, and they tended to blame the CIA. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Garrison sort of moved over and adopted Garrison's that. Garrison's final hypothesis theory. was it was a quote a rogue faction, his term of the CIA. Uh, Garrison had a lot of hypotheses. I have a page on my website about all the different yeah. things that Garrison said. We want to come back to that uh, <laughs> okay. interesting case and that interesting film, which really revived uh, the whole uh, excitement about conspiracy theories. Yes, it did. Uh, that's a film by that famous uh, Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone, of course. <laughs> and we'll return to Oliver Stone and to Jim Garrison and to that weird investigation and many others that have uh, popped up and down over the years. Uh, But we'll also look at the kind of logic or illogic that tends to work within the structure of these assassination theories. And your way of uh, suggesting that we can learn from all the mistaken uh, uh, theories of the Kennedy assassination, how to think more clearly about ambiguous events in the public world generally, including, say, 9-11, and things of that sort. Exactly. So directly back to John McAdams, and still we linger in New Orleans for a bit after we pause for an update on the news from Paula Cooper. Milt Rosenberg and Extension 720 on 720 WGN. And we return to John McAdams, author of JFK Assassination Logic. We were talking about Jim Garrison and the conspiracy theory that he whipped up, and he was really quite... Uh, inventive in that regard. He changed the theory a number of times. He went to court. He tried to prosecute uh, Clay Shaw, and Clay Shaw was acquitted. Right. Uh, it, it was a great circus. Uh, let's hear it. Let's hear him in full flight. Uh, Jim Garrison on a TV interview. The same phone number that Lee Oswell has in his address book as printed in volume 16 of the exhibit. Perhaps the uh, more significant example to us is the fact that that Ruby and Oswald have been seen together. But I cannot go into that at this time because we get into an area of evidence which I'm not free to comment on. But and you have witnesses, however, who have said they've seen yes. Ruby and Oswald together. Oh, yes. In Dallas or, or here? In, in more than one city, if you don't mind my putting it that way. Now, another another... Uh, connection to come from another direction is the fact that that uh, Jack Ruby had a a business acquaintance named Bertha Cheek, and uh, there were several uh, real estate transactions in which uh, uh, Jack Ruby and, and Bertha Cheek worked together, and, and uh, they know each other in a business way, and that's been established without any, any question, because uh, you can even find that in the Warren report. Now Bertha Cheek has a sister named Earlene Roberts. Earlene Roberts was the landlady where Lee Oswald was living when he was killed at 1026 North Beckley. So you have there the case of Bertha Cheek being a business associate of Jack Ruby. Bertha's sister is Earlene Roberts. Lee Oswald is staying at Earlene Roberts' house when he's arrested. So again, there's another correlation. Isn't this just a coincidence, uh, rather than something more solid, like somebody who'll swear they've been seen together? Any one of these, uh, actually, this is what you call circumstantial evidence. And your question is is certainly a good question to ask, but the answer is 
that circumstantial evidence is actually, uh, to, 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 to man that's practiced law, circumstantial evidence is actually more binding and harder to get away from than, than witness evidence. Well, that's... Kind of yeah, a stunning a lot of, a uh, lot of fact. There. Yeah, the, the f- same phone number. The, there was the same phone number after Garrison uh, engaged in some crypto analysis. Uh, he took a uh, number, I forget whether it was the number in Ruby's uh, phone book or Oswald's, mm-hmm. uh, ch- moved some digits around, subtracted an arbitrary number from it. I think it was 7,000. And after he'd moved the digits around and subtracted a completely arbitrary number, uh, it mm-hmm. translated into the phone number of the Dallas, uh, the, the Dallas office of the CIA. Now, That's except... Good. Here's the problem. Yeah. Um, I don't know why anyone would want to encode that because the Dallas office, the number of the Dallas office of the CIA was in the phone book. Uh, well, that's sort of numerological play. It's, yeah, that's yeah. used for all sorts of purposes. But what about his assertion here that there, the, there are these two sisters? One of them is a business <clears throat> associate of, of Ruby's, and the other is the lad lady of Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, that may be true, but I, I have met people, for example, that, uh, that knew Leonid Brezhnev. Uh, uh, one lady I used to know fairly well was a uh, elementary school associate of uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, I met the president of Marquette University one time who knew uh, sister uh, Mother Teresa. You know, if you use that kind of logic, you're uh, you can be uh, associated with lots and lots of people. Um, uh, there were a few witnesses who claimed to have seen Ruby and Oswald together, um, but to put that in context, there were tons of witnesses uh, who saw Oswald someplace doing something that the real Lee Harvey Oswald could not have done. Now, uh, a conspiracist have claimed that well, it was an Oswald imposter, uh, but if so. Uh, there was a terribly, a terribly incompetent conspiracy because there were just too many of those Oswald sightings. Uh, people who know something about memory uh, know that memory uh, is a reconstruction. Uh, people don't. It's not like what used to be called flashbulb memory. I mean, you know, we're, mm-hmm. you and I are both old enough to remember flashbulbs. That, that a, a scene is emblazoned on people's memory. That just it just doesn't work. Those are that usually way. false memories. In yeah, fact. yeah. In fact, it, it you just simply doesn't work that way. You can remember a scene where, let's say, somebody came into a gun shop and asked to have a scope mounted on a gun, and then you see Lee Oswald on television, and you, you make a connection. Oh, wait a minute. Gun, scope on a gun. I saw this guy in my store, uh, and Oswald's face can very easily be on the, in, in, a, in an honest memory, on the body of the fellow who walked in the store wanting a, uh, a scope put on the gun. As you reconstruct things, and yeah. since you've seen Oswald's face reproduced uh, on television and in, oh, yes. in newsprint uh, a thousand times. Yes. Um, here's a basic point, though. Uh, the war, you mentioned the Warren Commission report. The Warren Commission report uh, raised a lot of, first seemed persuasive, but then it raised a lot of doubt because much of it seemed rather strangely patched together. What seemed most unbelievable, most incredible in the whole Warren report, I think, was, and do you agree with me, the so-called single bullet theory? Um it's, it seems incredible because people have seen that diagram showing the bullet zig and zag in yeah. the air. The uh, single th- bullet theory says that one single bullet uh, had um, caused seven or is it eight different wounds? Se- seven different wounds, yeah. It, it, all right, except here's the deal. Um, the bullet would not have had to zig and zag in midair. People who actually have taken the trouble to look at photos of the motorcade. Uh, and the presidential limo and where Kennedy was positioned, where Connolly was positioned in mm. that limo, uh, multiple photos, virtually every one, show Connolly well in board of Kennedy, show Connolly below Kennedy because Connolly mm. was in a jump seat near the floor of the limo. And in fact, at the time the bullet hit, Connolly's torso was rotated to the right. So if you seriously try to model that, which a few people have done, indeed, this past Sunday evening on Nat and Geo, you saw Matt uh, Max Holland uh, model that, but several other people have done it. People expert in uh, forensic uh, uh, forensic mm-hmm. animation and modeling. Uh, what you find out is the trajectory works just fine. So you're quite persuaded that the single bullet theory is a yeah yeah is it, a correct theory. It, it, but if it wasn't the correct theory, we know a bullet entered Kennedy's back. The wound had an abrasion collar, which it, 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 it means an entry. Um, no bullet was found in Kennedy's body at the autopsy, and the X-rays of his body still exist. There was the x rays show no bullet in the body, so it exited. But if it exited, what happened? No bullet hit any place in the limo. Uh, 
The only place for it to hit would have been to hit John Connolly next to his right shoulder blade. Which but is you remember the, the popular complaint about all of this, or the popular uh, confusion, was, well, if the bull bullets hit him from the back, he doesn't uh, slump forward. Rather, his head snaps back towards the direction of the bullet. Well, that's a different bullet, okay? There's a bullet, the single bullet theory is about a bullet that hit Kennedy. Ah. Uh, and, and this is the one that did the head wound. Through, so that is the head this wound. This is the killer yeah. bullet. In the, in the head wound, yes, yeah. e e exactly. Um, forensics experts uh, say, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about the forensics experts for the Rockefeller Commission in the 70s mm -hmm. uh, and for the House Select Committee in, 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 later in the 70s, uh, say that bullets just don't throw people around. Uh, in fact, myth, myth busters on what is that on arts and entertainment i forget but mythbusters mm -hmm. actually tried shooting a dummy including shooting a dummy with a 50 caliber sniper's rifle which has vastly more kinetic energy than any plausible sniper's rifle that somebody might have used in dealey plaza uh, and bullets just don't throw people around they don't have enough kinetic energy to, to push people bodily uh, around that almost certainly was a neuromuscular reaction mm -hmm. uh, in fact uh, there were some experiments done on goats shooting them in the head and yes. you get to see a reaction where uh, they uh, th their back stiffens uh, their legs splay outward uh, because the strong muscles in the back predominate the great mystery in the whole assassination literature is uh, the man Lee Harvey Oswald, if he was the, the sole shooter, or if he was part of a uh, of a conspiracy, and if there were others shooting from Dealey Plaza, and so on. Either way, one still doesn't finally have a clear theory of Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> was he still a uh, essentially a Marxist uh, uh, fanatic who had lost some of his uh, great admiration for the Soviet Union having lived there and instead now uh, developed a new admiration for the true and pure uh, communist revolutionary, namely Fidel Castro. So he was taking revenge for uh, the assault against uh, Castro's Cuba, which had been, of course, organized by and supervised by uh, JFK. Or was he something quite different and even more uh, strangely deviant in terms of his psychological... Uh, quality was he essentially just looking for prominence, and this is one way to get an awful lot of attention very quickly. Or there are hundreds of other, well, there are dozens of other conjectures that have been formed about. Was he sexually uh, troubled and having difficulty with the wife who would push him out, and was he sort of taking revenge on her by killing the husband of? Uh, the glamorous uh, uh, Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, the last one, I don't think there's much uh, validity to. Well, I want to come to all of those. Or, oh, I wanna, okay. I want to get your thoughts on all this right. when we return <laughs> after we pause to do our brief uh, obeisance to capitalism. Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg on 720 WGN. And so, uh, returning to uh, John McAdams, uh, author of the new book, JFK assassination logic. Uh, instead of asking you about conspiracy theories more broadly, I'm asking you about Lee Harvey Oswald theories. <laughs> well, you outlined three theories. I think the sexual frustration theory probably doesn't explain very much. Uh, Marina was known to complain about Lee's uh, sexual performance, but I, I don't think that was a reason for a, uh, an assassination. The first two you outlined, which are in fact consistent, uh, was uh, first the idea uh, that Lee saw himself as the protector of the Cuban Revolution. Uh -huh. uh, Gene Davison, uh, an author who uh, wrote a book about Oswald, is I guess the most um, famous person who propounded this theory. That is reasonably plausible uh, because while Americans in general didn't know about the assassination plots against Castro, the left-wing press was talking about it. Lee read The Militant and The Worker. By the way, one a Stalinist publication, the other a Trotskyist publication. The Militant was a, a, a Trotskyite publication in those days still edited by uh, James Cannon, who later on became mm -hmm. a major mm -hmm. conservative anti-communist yeah. uh, the partisan. Yeah, the interesting thing is that Lee didn't know that Stalinist and uh, Trotskyists were supposed to hate each other. Uh -huh. um, uh, Fidel Castro himself ha had made a charge in 
an interview with an AP reporter that was widely published in the American press, including published in New Orleans while Lee was there, uh, that there were assassination plots against him. Uh, pretty much everybody in the U.S., the mainstream media, poo-pooed that. Uh, but, of course, Castro was telling the truth, and Lee would have believed Castro, so he may have been the volunteer um, protector of the Cuban Revolution. Uh, he wanted to be an historically important person. Um, he wrote a memoir of his time in the Soviet Union he called The Historic Diary. Now, he was miles away from being any person historic when he titled that Historic Diary, uh, but he thought he was someone destined to be uh, important. He actually told Marina at one time that he would be prime minister of the United States, which, of course, implies uh, uh, not only a lot of upward mobility right, on his part, but a change in, yeah, yeah. A change in government. Yeah. So, so those two are indeed consistent. I think some combination of those two uh, uh, pretty much explain Lee Oswald as best we can. And, uh, you know, the psychology of some people are, is hard to explain. There's a subject called abnormal psychology. There is indeed. Yes. And uh, 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 you're a psychologist, so may, maybe uh, when you but took the course there's... or taught the course, you were convinced you had your mind around that. I'm the wisest not... of all thoughts on these matters is was in the classic introduction to the radio serial The Shadow. Who knows what evil works in the hearts <laughs> of men? The shadow does, the shadow but does. but we don't. <laughs> I, uh, Except there's a lot of evil lurking around. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not convinced I understand Oswald thoroughly. I'm, I just, uh, the, well, so I just outline he, two, two reasonably plausible things. You do agree that he made an attempt on General, what's his name before oh, yeah, that? General Walker. Yeah. General Walker. The best evidence of that is a note he left from a marina, uh, which still exists in the National Archives. It's in his handwriting where he doesn't say, I'm going to shoot at General Walker, mm -hmm. but he gives her instructions about what she should do if he is killed or captured. Uh, Marina's testimony is that she found it uh, on Lee's desk in a mm -hmm. private study he had. This was in the Neely Street apartment. He'd given her strict instructions not to go into his private office, but one night he was way late. He was supposed to be at typing class, uh, and he was way, way late, and she went in there and, and found uh, found the note, uh, which was very, de in his handwriting, it was very detailed instructions what to do if he was captured or killed. Um, and it doesn't say I shot at Walker, but if he if he didn't shoot at Walker, what what was he doing? He told Marina he shot at Walker, by yeah. the way. Make clear to our listeners, uh, General Walker was once rather well-known. By now, I suppose he would be an obscure reference for most yep. uh, listeners. Uh, who was he, and why was he an appropriate target for a guy like Oswald? Well, he was a very right-wing uh, general in the uh, U.S. Army who had been sacked by Kennedy for indoctrinating his troops um, um, in, in, in rather ex very extreme uh, right-wing uh, political views. Uh, Oswald viewed him uh, as a, a potential fascist. The truth is he ran for office in Texas and I think got 3% of the vote or something, but Lee thought uh, he, he was a potential threat. And in fact, Lee told Marina, gosh, if somebody had killed Hitler early on, wouldn't the world have been better off? Do you know the book by James Pearson? No, I don't, actually. Uh, he's a guy who used to run... I've heard of it, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's at the Manhattan Institute now. He used to run the Olin Foundation. Okay. He's also a PhD in political science, as yeah. are you. Yeah, I've, I've heard of Pearson, but I, yeah. I, I've only seen reference to the book. I haven't and, read it. And uh, he makes a great deal in this book of how the American left generally uh, did not want to believe or to see uh, a, uh, a possible, quote, communist or certainly a left-wing radical in general political orientation as the assassin. Um, and he then relates that also to the, <coughs> to the invention uh, by Jacqueline <coughs> particularly, excuse me, of the Camelot myth yeah. as somehow a, a different kind of cover story. I don't quite get that connection, though I did talk with Pearson. He was a, a guest on this program about four or five years ago. But um, was there a reluctance in America generally to really ex see him as motivated politically um, and motivated by left political commitments? In, in, in fact, uh, Max Holland, the same guy who was featured in the Nat Geo special on Sunday, wrote an essay that uh, it's actually on my website. It first appeared in a history journal where he said that the Warren Commission tended to back away a bit from talking about political motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the reason is uh, talking about uh, Oswald's leftist political motivation seemed a bit dangerous because people might make uh, some connections and say it was really Castro that it was, was responsible or the Soviet.
Soviet Union was really responsible. And that was dangerous in terms of international relations. If Americans had decided that, say, Castro was uh, responsible, uh, there might be demands to invade Cuba. And, of course, any invasion of Cuba would have been terribly dangerous uh, because, you know, the Soviets uh, viewed themselves as the protectors of uh, Castro. So I think that is true uh, to a degree uh, that uh, his political motivation was was downplayed a, a bit. Well, there was also, as I remember it, within the CIA, uh, in the immediate year or two following, a great crisis because there was a famous defector from Soviet intelligence who brought the news that Oswald uh, really uh, had lost all faith and uh, in communism, uh, so so as to establish that he couldn't possibly have been an agent doing this murder for the Soviet Union. Well, that was Yuri, Yuri Nosenko. The Nosenko, Yuri Nosenko yeah. Um, and they grilled Nosenko and, uh, for five they, or six years before well, they gosh, uh, believed There was a guy named James Jesus Angleton Indeed. with the CIA who was really looked to be close to being paranoid. Uh, but he was the head of counterintelligence. Yes, he was. And Yuri Nosenko was... Uh, close to being tortured, if not actually tortured by the CIA, for example, put in a cold cell and, and, um, because um, the CIA disbelieved him. He had said some things that were a bit untrue, uh, probably certainly not because he was a disinformation agent for the KGB, but because I think he was sort of inflating his own importance a bit. But if you, you know, he, he did that, and then uh, uh, people in the CIA noticed it, and they started doubting his bona fides. Uh, I think the historical um, um, verdict has to be, yes, he was telling the truth. Uh, Oswald was not a Soviet agent uh, uh, of any kind, uh, and uh, you know, I, I think there's really no question that he was a was not a Soviet agent. Uh, what are the overall? This is essentially a book of applied logical analysis, in which you're teaching something about how to think and how to. Uh, you're you're at Marquette University up in Madison, on one of the the old buildings. There is emblazoned a quote from some place or other uh, about uh, how the business is to sift and winnow to discover the truth. Or, well, and or sift and winnow, separating the wheat from the chaff yeah, to yeah. get at the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the and that's key, what you're saying can e be done e with, exactly. with, one, with materials of this sort as well. Right. One chronic problem is that authors, particularly conspiracy authors, but sometimes lone assassin authors, uh, pay, much, pay too much attention to evidence that's not terribly strong, particularly eyewitness testimony, while paying too little attention to things such as uh, the ballistic evidence, mm -hmm. uh, spent cartridges, bullets uh, that match a particular rifle or, or pistol uh, to the exclusion of all other weapons. Uh, the conspiracists uh, actually uh, rely, rely heavily on witness testimony about uh, John Kennedy's wounds. Uh, they claim the back of Kennedy's head was blown out, implying a shot from the front, from the grassy no, uh, really, really pounding witness testimony. Uh, but the best evidence is, of course, the autopsy photos and x-rays. Now, uh, conspiracists say those were faked or forged. Uh, but uh, in the 1970s, the House Select Committee, under the re leadership of, of Robert Blakey, um, enlisted the best experts in the country in a variety of disciplines, um, including forensic anthropology, photography, yeah. etc. And acoustical analysis. And yeah, they and came up on the basis of acoustic evidence uh, with, the, uh, with the conclusion at that time yeah, yeah. that there were other shooters on the grassy knoll. Yeah, well, I'll be glad to get to that in a minute. The key point is the autopsy photos and x-rays pass the most rigorous scientific yeah. test. They are the best evidence. So that's what you look at to figure out Kennedy's wounds. Uh, if you look at witness testimony, if you're very selective, you can make a case. If you really try compiling all of it, you find that it's contradict the witnesses contradict each other. They can be all over the place. It is time for us, after we okay. pause, as we're, which we're going to do in just a moment, for an update on this. But it is time for us to go to the grassy knoll okay. and to the evidence, acoustical, according to Blakey originally, um, in, when the committee was uh, doing its final report, though he may have changed his mind since then. He's a very distinguished professor of law uh, at, North, at um, Notre Dame, Dame, where he's yeah. been for some time. Uh, uh, but also the direct sightings, according to many witnesses, of people up on the grassy knoll, uh, dashing off in one or another direction. We need to try to sort some of that out. And 
you need to demonstrate, as I know you can because you do it in the book, that uh, none of that is real evidence. Yeah. We'll return directly then to John McAdams drawing from his fascinating uh, recently published book, JFK Assassination Logic, How to Think About Claims of Conspiracy. But now to the WGN newsroom and Paula Cooper. Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg on 720 WGN. And we return uh, to the quest for the truth about the Kennedy assassination. John McAdams has been sorting it all out and uh, has written a very powerful book, I think, about this. And it's really a book about how to think about conspiracy theories when they're put before you. Uh, The title of this work is JFK Assassination Logic, How to Think About Claims of Conspiracy. Let's go to the grassy knoll. Um, what's it like up there? <laughs> what's it like up there? Uh, it's the, Behind the stockade fence is now paved, and you can still drive down the old M Extension and park right back there if uh-huh. you want to. Park at the place that uh, uh, conspiracists say there was a uh, there was a shooter. There are actually two places that are uh, pointed out by conspiracists as a possible shooter locations. But, uh, but, uh, but that's what it's uh, like now. And the stockade fence is still there. And, and there are staves missing all the time because tourists take them sure. and they have to be replaced. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but, but that's what it's like. <laughs> and they can also go up to the, uh, what is it, the sixth floor? Sixth floor the, museum, yes. Of the book depository, which is now the museum. It is now uh, a museum. I'm going to be there next month oh, giving yes. a presentation. Giving yes. a presentation. But what about the, gla- the, the grass? I see no portion of the conspiracy theories. Okay. Number one, the medical evidence is quite clear that no shot hit Kennedy from the right front. Uh-huh. For example, uh, a shot from the a grassy no uh, would have would hit him from the right front, but if you look at the x-rays of his skull, there are no bullet fragments to the left of center line. Uh, and indeed, there's certainly no exit on the left side uh, of his skull, uh, which would pretty clearly indicate that, no, he wasn't hit from the right front. Now, you could posit a grassy knoll shooter uh, that missed, uh, but there's no evidence of that. There are some witnesses who say they saw a grassy knoll shooter. Exactly, yes. But they have, there are problems with all of them. For example, Jean Hill, uh, before she passed away, I think it was in 2000, 2001, was claiming that she had seen a shoot, looked up on the grassy knoll and actually seen uh, a shooter. Uh, the problem is about 45 minutes after, the assassination, she was interviewed by Jimmy Darnell of WBAP TV Fort Worth. The film still exists, and he asked her point blank, Did you see a shooter? And she said, I didn't see a shooter. Darnell said, You only heard? And she said, I only heard. Uh, there's a guy uh, named uh, Ed Hoffman uh, who claims to have been able to see the area behind uh, the stockade fence uh, who described a, a man in a suit. He called him Suit Man, shooting Kennedy, uh, walking down the fence and mm-hmm. handing off the rifle, actually tossing it to a guy in a railroad uniform he called Railroad Man who knelt behind the signal box uh, and disassembled it and then walked away. Two or three problems with uh, his testimony. First of all, that's not apparently what he was saying in an early F- early to the FBI in 1967, I think. Uh, number two, you could not just walk down that fence line because uh, cars were jammed up there. We have that fact from a guy named Sam Holland who ran around behind the stockade fence immediately. He and his buddies were climbing over bumpers and fenders and they could barely move. Further, uh, those guys who were on the triple underpass had a clear line of sight to the area behind the signal box where uh, Hoffman's so-called railroad man was disassembling the rifle. They didn't report any such person. The person with the best view behind the stockade fence was a guy in the signal tower named Lee Bowers, uh, who was paying some attention. He told the Warren Commission that he saw, saw two guys behind the stockade fence. Uh, they asked if they were appeared to be together. He said, "No, they did not appear to be together." Um, he asked. They were. He was. He was asked by Warren Commission Counsel, "Did did they stay after the shooting?" And he said, "One of them he knew stayed. The other one he wasn't sure of because uh, his clothes blended in with the foliage." Uh, But at least one of them did not flee in any way, shape, or form. He just stayed around, and he didn't see them doing anything suspicious. Uh, And he was actually well-positioned to see someone shooting behind the the stockade fence. So Lee Bowers really is the best witness to what was going on behind the stockade fence, and he didn't see any shooter. Um, It's time to come to your overall view of why things went this badly wrong in terms of the memories and the th- the thinking and ultimately the theory formulation done by so many others. Um, and 
what I, as a psychologist, find great in, uh, interest in is, of course, that you're really dealing with the way in which we reconstruct memory and fill in all the gaps and try to make things more meaningful and more purposive than, in fact, chaotic reality really yeah, is. Yeah, that's true. Uh, this is given in just the titles of the separate chapters. I just want to run through all of sure. those. Uh, the Frailty of Witness Testimony. Each of these is the title of a chapter. Problems of memory, creating false memories, witnesses who are just too good, bogus quoting, stripping context, misleading readers, probability, things that defy the odds, more on defying the odds, the mysterious deaths. Uh, did people know it was going to happen? Signal and noise, seeing things in photos. Uh, not all evidence is equal, using reliable evidence. Too much evidence, too much evidence of conspiracy. Beware false corroboration, how bureaucrats act, putting theory into practice, the single bullet theory, thinking about conspiracy, putting it all together. As you put it all together, what's the nature of human fallibility that leads us into this sort of thing? And how could you generalize from this uh, grossly conspiratorial interest in the um, shooting and killing of a president, how can you connect that to or see that as a model for what we've done more recently with other uh, great tragic public events like 9-11? Uh, uh, sure. Um, there, are often, there are a lot of analogies. For example, uh, there are people who claim to see uh, all kinds of evidence of conspiracy in photos shot around Dealey uh, a Plaza. Um, it, it, it's a well-known fact of social psychology that people see uh, in ambiguous, ambiguous stimuli what they expect to see, what they've been primed to see, perhaps what they want to see. Uh, and, and, and if you, you know, the 9-11 conspiracy people, they see the Twin Towers collapsing and they say, oh, that looks like a controlled demolition. Well, it doesn't really. A real controlled demolition, it's you blow it out from the bottom and it comes down. Uh, but it, uh, they, they say that, uh, gosh, uh, on every floor, uh, thermite, explosives were placed and they blew out the towers uh, and, and they they honestly see that or think they see that. What's happening, of course, is when a floor comes down, it compresses the air in the floor below it and it blows out. Uh, so you get, yes, the windows blowing out in every floor as it comes down, but that's compressed air. That's not a thermite uh, explosion, and that's not the way you bring down a, any building with a controlled demolition anyway. But people are, are, uh, are convinced that they, uh, that they see that. Um, sometimes people who don't understand something see something phony. Like um, in the moon landing, there's a, a flag uh, that is uh, unfurled, and it's mm -hmm. b moving as though it were blowing in the wind. Uh, of course, there's no atmosphere on the moon, so it couldn't really be waving in the wind. So, so it must those, be Arizona. Yeah, yeah Arizona. Mm -hmm. What people don't know is, number one, you can see it because it had an aluminum bar to hold it up to yeah. make a good picture. Number two, uh, the uh, astronaut who, who opened it up uh, moved it a bit, and it started moving. And since there is no air on the moon to dampen uh, the uh, the waving, it waved for you know quite a while. Um it's an example of people seeing something because they don't actually understand uh, what's going on. It's a lot like people who see fakery in the backyard photos. Um, uh, people think something is fake because they don't understand it. Indeed, uh, uh, I have to point out that Barack Obama released his uh, uh, vault copy of his birth certificate. The Internet was abuzz with people who saw evidence of fakery in that birth yeah, certificate. Yeah, the birthers would not give up, would yeah, yeah. they? The, yeah. the, the, it's pretty easy to see evidence of fakery if you are an amateur <laughs> a question documents yeah. expert and don't know much about the subject. Uh, often, if you're actually an expert, it doesn't look fake at all. Sometimes, even if you're an expert, you can make a tremendous fool of yourself. A great case in point, in a totally different realm, is uh, <clears throat> Trevor Roper, the great British Hugh, historian. Hugh, Hugh Trevor Roper, yeah. Hugh Trevor Roper, who validated the uh, discovery of the great diaries of Adolf Hitler. Uh, that happened. Which were a total forgery, of course. Yeah, except uh, my impression is he's a historian, not a question documents expert. To be sure. Yeah, to yeah, be sure. yeah. which is why you want real experts ah, uh, in the appropriate point. subfield yeah. rather than people who are kind of expert about something kind of related. Yeah. We are about to pause for a quick round of commercials and then on to uh, the phones and the email. <clears throat> and so, uh, if you're now uh, ready to 
raise a question or offer a thought, and I think we'll probably hear from one or two people who are persistent and indefatigable uh, theorists of uh, the conspiracy, despite all that you've said tonight. But they're sure. welcome, by all, means, by all means, so long as they keep it on the short side. Uh, but the lines are open. The number, of course, is 312-591-7200. 312-591-7200 for any question or comment you want to address to John McAdams, author of JFK Assassination Logic. If you are far away, listening over the Internet, and want to get to us via email, that's very acceptable. And the email address is extension720 at wgnradio.com. Extension720 as one word, at wgnradio.com. Or, for phones again, 312-591-7200. Get your calls and emails in instantly, and we'll be with you right after this. Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg on 720 WGN. And we will now go directly to the phones for your questions and comments to John McAdams. 312-591-7200, the number. All the lines were taken a moment ago. I see now one line is available. If you try us and get the busy signal, what you should do is simply try again right after we say goodnight to a prior caller. And I don't know who the first caller is, but shortly I will be so informed, I trust, and then we'll go there. Uh, If somebody in the booth will inform me. And here it is. Uh, Bob is... First up, good evening, you're on the air. Oh, hi, Dr. Rosenberg. Um, Yeah, I'm not a conspiracy nut or anything like that, but I've always wondered, uh, you know, there's all different conspiracies about, you know, the mob doing it or Castro or whatever. I always wonder, why did Jack Ruby uh, shoot Oswald? I've always wondered that. Just uh, A very good basic question. We didn't get around to that, though uh, probably we should. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Because because uh, the Ruby shooting Oswald convinced a lot of people there had to be a conspiracy. First of all... Because he was a, a mafia... Uh, he, he had mafia a lot, associate. Well, he, let's put it, well, not really. He had a lot of. He he knew a fair number of mobsters. Uh, Ruby knew almost everybody. He knew a large number of the Dallas cops. He knew a large n- number of the people in the Dallas media. Uh, he was a gate crasher, a, a schmoozer, a, um, a, a guy who prided himself on knowing everybody. Uh, people who actually know him uh, don't believe he was a plausible hitman uh, for the mob. He was a very volatile character, very emotional uh, character. He could be extraordinarily humane trying to help people. On the other hand, if he got mad at you, he had brass knuckles. He was, for example, his own bouncer at his strip club, the Carousel Club. The key thing about uh, Ruby, I think, uh, needs to be understood, is if you look at his actions uh, on the morning, that Sunday morning, uh, when he shot Oswald, um, he got out of bed uh, later than Oswald was supposed to be transferred. It had been announced that Oswald would be transferred at 10 a.m. Uh, he woke up a little after that, got a call from one of his strippers saying she needed money to pay the rent. Could he wire it to her? He drove into downtown Dallas, the Western Union office, uh, wired her the money. The clerk said that he did not appear to be impatient or in a hurry. Then, according to his testimony, he left the Western Union office. About a half a block away was the Main Street ramp uh, that led down to the basement of the Dallas Police Department. He saw people gathered outside there. Uh, I don't know if he inferred that Oswald hadn't been moved or just wondered what was going on. So he walked down there, walked down the ramp, and arrived, oh, uh, 30 seconds to a minute before Oswald was brought out. Now, if if he was a hitman, that's not very professional. No. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't show up. You know, I wouldn't come into Marquette thirty minutes or uh, 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 thirty seconds or, or or a minute before I had to go down the class. And Milt wouldn't come to W in the WGN thirty seconds or a minute before he was scheduled to go on the air. So it really does look like a spur of the moment. Um, action uh, on the part of somebody who is very emotional, very volatile, uh, mm. carried a gun with him all the time because he always had a lot of money on him. He always had a lot of money on him because he was in trouble with the IRS. And I think we all know what the IRS will do uh, if yeah. you put if you owe them a lot of money and you put money in the bank. Oh, yeah. Well, I got though. I appreciate that. Can I just really one one very quick question? Uh, did did Oswald ever say why he did it? Or he, he always denied doing it. Oh, okay. okay. He's consistently oh. denied doing it. He didn't oh. have much time because it, that's true. No, no, he was no, dispatched no, by right, Ruby right. just uh, two <laughs> days later. Or exactly, yeah. 
But okay. he, he did, uh, thank you, sir, for the quote. He did identify himself. He said of himself, I'm, I'm a patsy. Yeah. Uh, he, he said, uh, they're taking me in because I've been to the Soviet Union. It's kind of interesting he didn't say something like, I was told to wait for Mr. E. Howard Hunt on the second floor of the, uh, of the uh, uh, depository. Um, his own theory, his own claim was essentially that uh, there had been a crime, the president had been assassinated, and they were just looking around, looking around after the assassination for someone to arrest, someone to make a patsy of. Um, you know, he didn't say I was set up. Uh, he didn't rat out any co-conspirators. Here he is saying it. I, uh, I don't know what this is all about. I killed the president. Also, I did keep the the uh, Sir? Did you shoot the president? I work in that building. Were you in the building at the time? Naturally, if I work in that building, yes, sir. Back up, man. Did you oh, the president? No, they're taking me in because of the fact that I live in the Soviet Union. I'm just a patsy. There it is. Yeah. W- 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 uh, was that at the Dallas Police Department directly after his arrest? Um, I'm not sure how directly. Uh, uh, but it's on the first. That, whether it was the, that afternoon or whether it was It's on was November anything. 22nd. It is no, on November 22nd, yeah. yes. And it's November 24th, I think. When that he shot, yes. When he shot and killed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> With all the country watching. Yes, with all the good. At least people who are watching ABC didn't carry it. I think NBC did. I yeah. don't know about CBS. Incredible. Uh, let's go quickly to another caller, 312-591-7200. And Reynolds joins us. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi. Yeah, my name is Rich. I'm in Indiana. And uh, I was a conspiracy, conspiracy theorist for many years, ever since I was 15 years old. Um, in fact, I did a whole report on it at Purdue University. And I've read the Warren Report several times. That is until 10 years ago, I made a trip to Dealey Plaza for the first time. And I realized how plausible, how doable, how easy for a shooter up in that book depository would be to make that shot. In fact, even with my 22 rifle, I think I could make that shot 7 out of 10 times without a problem. It's important to understand that when you actually step into Dealey Plaza, it looks much smaller than it does on any photos. Uh, I'm not enough of a photo expert to know why that is, but I can testify that it's true, and several of my students have had the same perception. It looks much larger in photos than it does if you're actually there. The headshot would have been at a distance of 87 yards with a four-power scope on a rifle. That's not a terribly difficult uh, shot. Um, and so um, the, the, yeah, the caller's perceptions of that are, are pretty mm-hmm. common. Yeah. We thank you, sir, for the call. And uh, we'll go directly to another, 312-591-7200. I should say we've now got a number of lines available. Some lines have been cleared, so get in there if you've got a question or a, a thought that you want to share. 312-591-7200, and Dean is up next. Good evening. You're on the air. Hello. Are you there? Apparently, Dean is not there. Uh, so we'll go to uh, Ben. And Ben, are you there? I'm there, Milt. How are you? Just fine. Please go ahead. Great. Mr. McAdams, a uh, quick question. Um, I had an opportunity just several years back to meet a uh, witness to the assassination, uh, Mr. James Tague. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious if you have any uh, theory on what bullet or what fragment or what it was that hit the curb and actually wounded him. I've yeah. never had anyone explain to me just that exact uh, idea. Oh, there are all kinds of uh, theories about that. Joel Posner um, uh, claims that a uh, the first bullet hit a twig and um, um, uh, was deflected down there. I think the most plausible theory, uh, which, by the way, was propounded by... Uh, uh, in the best the best of all conspiracy books, which is Josiah Thompson's Six Seconds in Dallas, is simply that he was hit by a fragment uh, from the headshot. We know that at least uh, one fragment left Kennedy's head headed forward with a lot of velocity uh, because there's a rather deep ding in the chrome topic of the windshield. Now, cars in 63, particularly Lincoln's, were built a lot more solidly than those de- these days, and uh, it was pretty heavy metal uh, and, uh, and chrome on it, of course, and uh, uh, there was a pretty severe ding in that. So I think that's actually probably the most likely uh, explanation. Uh, I don't know that anyone knows absolutely for sure, but um, I think that's the most likely. Okay. Um, I accept that. Thanks. We thank you, sir, for the call. Were you ever a conspiracy believer? 
Not really. Uh, the first, I, I mean, I saw, for example, uh, uh, the uh, CBS documentary in the 1970s. Uh, I read a few things from um, um, lone assassin people. Like I read an article by Tom Bethel in the Washington Monthly, which was a great political magazine in the 1970s, about the Garrison investigation. So um, I was, I think, kind of skeptical from early on. But, but not terribly interested until uh, the early 90s. What drew your interest to it, actually? Well, uh, I got involved in an Internet discussion group about the assassination. I like to think of myself as sort of a debunker by, te- by uh-huh. temperament. If there's some notion going around that's just not true, I sort of instinctively want to say that's not true. So I started finding all kinds of stuff uh, being asserted that, that it just wasn't true. Uh, and um, with the JFK assassination, if you're a debunker, it, it's uh, what fighter pilots call a target-rich environment. <laughs> There's just a lot of stuff that's uh, bogus and a lot of fun debunking it. And since you're a practiced and uh, uh, and uh, gratified debunker, I must read you a question that's come in by email, but I'll look forward to your answer after we pause okay. for an upcoming newscast. Uh, and this one simply says, what are your guest comments on Yeti, Bigfoot, and the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> okay. we'll, so it's a question of monsters, and we'll be directly on to that after this. Yeah. Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg on 720 WGN. And so to uh, persist with the question that I was reading a moment ago that came in by email, if one applies your general critical standards to a very different question, is there anything behind the stories of Yeti or Bigfoot? They, there are that's, those are two ways of designating the same creature right. or the Loch Ness Monster. Um, first of all, I'm not any kind of expert <laughs> on, the, on those subjects. Uh, I'm going to have a kind of general skepticism thinking that if there was much to that, there would be some hard evidence mm-hmm. somewhere. In a sense, it's like a, the grassy knoll shooter. There are all kinds of reports, but you look at them carefully, just know. For the Loch Ness evidence. Monster, the, the basic evidence was one particular picture, which one was seen again and again. And I gather it's either a, a forgery, an early kind of a Photoshop kind of uh, improvisation, or else it's just been misinterpreted. Uh, I assume so, but I don't. I, I haven't yeah. actually studied that, I have All to admit. Right. Yeah. We go back to the phones, 312-591-7200. And next up, John. Good evening. You're on the air. Hello, uh, Dr. McAdams. Uh, you made an assertion about the ease of the shot. I, I think it's closer to 90 yards, and you mentioned the scope used. Uh, the Warren Commission came to the conclusion that the scope was ineffective. It had to be reworked uh, as in remounted and shimmed before it would sight properly. The optics had to be rebuilt also. So they came to the conclusion it was a boresighted shot. Uh, secondly, you made assertions about S.M. Holland and Company, his five coworkers on the bridge. The reason that they ran to the place where Ed Hoffman claims he saw someone was because they believed the shooter had come from behind the fence. And uh, thirdly, lastly, most of all, you, you make assertions about specious claims of a grassy knoll shooter from witnesses on the ground. One of those witnesses was on the left rear bumper of President Kennedy's car. He was a mounted police officer named Bobby Hargis. He was, at the instant President Kennedy's head exploded, he was struck with such force in his chest it nearly knocked him off his motorcycle. He believed he'd been struck by the projectile. He dumped his motorcycle, examined himself. He didn't find a, a wound, but he did find that he was covered from, with gore, ejected from the President's head, from his knee to his helmet. He immediately sprinted across the street, drew his gun, and went to the very spot at the wooden fence on the top of the knoll where a dozen or more witnesses claim the shot came from. How do you explain that? Well, let's take them one at a time. Um, the scope was indeed badly knocked out of alignment when the rifle was recovered. Um, there are two possibilities there. Number one, uh, when Oswald put it in a, uh, in a stack of boxes uh, near the uh, stairwell of the northwest corner of the depository, he Who, found, have, that? Who found that rifle, by the way? Uh, either Seymour Weissman or Eugene Boone, I think. Uh, Roger Eugene Boone. Craig also. They all. Uh, all no, three. no, 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 no. Roger Craig, Seymour no. Weissman. Sir, hold on, a minute. No, no, hold on. Uh, you you post. Listen Let's to me. Just take that one at a time. L- listen to the man who runs the program, please. <laughs> okay, <laughs> be, go ahead. Be I'm calm. Sorry. Now I'm going to set a general rule for you. You pose three interesting points, and obviously you're uh, well versed in these materials, but we're going to have to. Not do this in argumentative uh, interchange. No, I'm sorry. Go but ahead. just no, we're going to get a response, and then when uh, when uh, uh, John's response is finished, if you want to have a last word, you can have it. Sure. Thank you. Those uh, are my rules. 
Okay. Number one, uh, Oswald may have simply knocked it out of alignment uh, trying to jam it in those boxes to, to hide it. Admittedly, you can only hide it temporarily, but to just keep it out of, of sight. Another possibility is that it was misaligned in Oswald since that uh, and used the iron sights. Remember, Oswald uh, had qualified. That, had qualified. Do as, not interrupt, or I will take you off the air. Has Please. qualified as a sharpshooter in the Marines, uh, shooting an M1 a Garin rifle with uh, iron sights. Now, uh, it is quite true uh, that Holland and his buddies thought the shots came, for, or at least Holland said he was sure the last shot came from uh, the uh, from the stockade fence. Uh, if you actually uh, stand on that triple underpass or even look at a picture of it, you can see that uh, that would just be a few degrees away from the depository. There's no doubt that they thought that. They didn't find any shooter when they got back there. They found some cigarette butts on the ground and some footprints, but no evidence that that uh, was a uh, was a shooter. That's a response to two of the three points the caller made. Once as, as for Bobby Hargis, uh, he didn't see a shooter uh, on the knoll. Never claimed um, he did. Okay. Um, he, his own explanation of what happened, he was uh, questioned by garrison researchers, okay, and asked, did he see uh, Kennedy's head explode? He said he saw the, quote, splash come out the other side. Given that he was behind and to the left of Kennedy, the other side would have been the right front, not the back. Now, how did he get splattered with Kennedy's brain matter? If you look at the Zapruder film, you'll see Kennedy's brain matter is blown into the air. Hargis said, and I quote, I run through it. Uh, it was blown into the air. It was a horrid mess. Not only was Hargis hit by Kennedy's brain matter, Officer Cheney on the right side of Kennedy was hit by Kennedy's brain matter. Um, Nellie Connolly was hit by Kennedy's brain matter. She said it was like being hit by spent buckshot. Um, there was brain matter found on the back of the coat of, uh, uh, of Agent Greer, who was the driver. Um, but if you look at the if you look at the Zapruder film, it's clear where Kennedy's head explodes. It explodes uh, uh, on the top and uh, and uh, toward I... the right. And now one more thing about Bobby Hargis: he did not run up to the stockade fence. He ran across the street, part way up the grassy slope, looked around, came back, and got on his motorcycle and drove under the triple underpass to see if he could see anything on the other side. Now, sir, you've showed admirable restraint, and you can have two minutes if you want to say whatever you do, no, it, it, but no it, more it, than that. Please, don't talk minute. while I'm talking. Wait okay. until I finish this gracious invitation that I'm offering you. You may have two minutes, and then we stop. Go ahead. Uh, firstly, Bob, you didn't explain why Bobby Hargis was nearly knocked off of his motorcycle. Uh, Secondly, he was not. Mr. Hargis, his own testimony before the Warren Commission is that he charged, he, wa he charged across the street, went slowly up the knoll and drew his gun and checked the wooden fence. He was joined, as dozens of eyewitnesses confirmed and photographic evidence confirms, by another officer charging his motorcycle up the hill, which immediately dumped. This occurred within 10 seconds of the shooting, sir. Secondly, your assertions about the weapon being found. Uh, Weitzman, Boone, Roger Craig found the weapon secreted behind some boxes. They all executed the affidavits immediately identifying the gun as a 7.62 millimeter Mauser, not a 6.5 millimeter Carcano. Weitzman was the acknowledged weapons expert, as attested to by Chief Detective Fritz. Uh, thirdly, Nell Connolly was crouched over John Connolly at the time. Her assertions about the direction where the shot came from, uh, you can look at the Zapruder film and see that she doesn't really know. As for the uh, gore being ejected from Kennedy's head, witnesses, once again, on that side of the street, all attested that the, the larger portion of it was directed at Hargis. And there was actually a shadow on McLean's vehicle, as you know, where you could see where Hargis shielded him from the gore being ejected. Sir, with that, I thank you sincerely. Uh, you are obviously very, very well versed in this material. I and we'll, uh, but I, and of course, I want some further response uh, from uh, John McAdams. Uh, clearly, here's uh, this fellow is a true believer, but he's an, he's got his own expertise. Oh, sure. Uh, if you actually look at the photographic evidence, uh, Bobby Hargis did not run all the way up to the fence. By the way, no motorcycle cop drove his uh, motor uh, up the grassy. No, actually, several witnesses said a motorcycle cop did. The best evidence is uh, the photos of Dealey Plaza. Uh, the cop was Clyde Haygood, who tried to jump the curb to drive his motor 
up uh, the grassy slope, but failed to, and then he parked it uh, in uh, Elm Street. There's film footage showing him doing that. Uh, then he ran up to uh, the corner uh, where the stockade fence meets the triple underpass. Hargis, by the way, was mm-hmm. not in Dealey Plaza at the time of the shooting. Um, do I have time to talk about Roger Craig? Well, I want to say one thing before that. Uh, I think uh, I, it's hard for me to just stop that guy. He's got loads to say, obviously, and he will undoubtedly feel he was mistreated because you've got more time than he. But then you're the guest in the studio, and he's a mm-hmm. caller. However, I know you operate a website which deals with these matters. He should really be in touch with you uh, and well, go public on the website, shouldn't well, he? Well, what, what he should do is look at my website. I have a whole page on Roger Craig, yeah. who later came to say that the discovered rifle was a 7.6. 5 Mauser. Uh, the, a guy named Tom Allie shot 16 millimeter film of the rifle being discovered. The rifle discovered was a 6.5 millimeter Manneker Carcano. Does your website allow for contributions from uh, others? No, it doesn't. Ah. It, it's not a discussion board. Although there is alt.assassination.jfk, uh, which is an internet news group, um, which can be gotten, the simplest way for most people to get it is on Google Groups. So if mm-hmm. they search Google Groups for alt.assassination.jfk, yes, uh, they can post uh, on that group and they can post questions exactly like that. And this same caller can certainly reach you. Well, he's certainly welcome to via you. Via email or? Yeah, yeah, john.mcadams at marquette.edu. There we are. And we pause for a last round of commercials and then back to the phones. Extension 720 with Milt Rosenberg on 720 WGN. The book that we've been drawing for, that we have been drawing from tonight is by John McAdams, professor of political science at Marquette University, and it is titled JFK Assassination Logic: How to Think About Claims of Conspiracy. And the publisher is uh, Potomac Books. Potomac Books, and we go back to the phones three one two five nine one seventy two hundred. And next up is Glenn, who has reached us at WGN Radio. Good evening, sir. Oh, good evening, Professor McAdams. This is Glenn Sarlito. Uh, oh, hi, hi, Glenn. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing fine. Who is Glenn? Uh, he's a, a buddy from Milwaukee. <laughs> yes. I got a few questions for you regarding your class at Marquette. Sure. What's the take? Uh, what are the students' take on the assassination? Are they asking the right questions? And are they following the historical method when they're concluding? And then I have one more after that. Sure. Um is, Outside of that, you well, can answer this one. Sure, what sure. do you feel was the WC, the Warren Commission's, biggest mistake in not being able to influence the majority of the people? Well, first of all, uh, uh, what's my students' take on the uh, uh, on the assassination? Um, I debunk a lot of conspiracy, silly conspiracy factoids in class. Um, I don't tell students that there was no conspiracy. Uh, it's hard to prove a negative. I want students to, uh, um, for example, know about uh, the witness testimony about a grassy knoll shooter. I want them to know what the autopsy photos and x-rays show. So I debunk a lot of conspiracy stuff in class. On the other hand, I have a fair number of students, uh, even at the end, believe in a conspiracy because, you know, I can't debunk um, everything, and I don't particularly try to tell them that there was no conspiracy. I, students ask, and I, I won't tell them. Uh, probably none are listening tonight because they're headed home for Thanksgiving. <laughs> but um, uh, um, uh, as for their using the historical method, well, that's what I encourage them to do. And uh, like all students, some are more successful than others, but most are pretty good. Now, do I have time for the problem? Well, yes, go ahead, please. War- Warren Commission's biggest uh, era was not looking at the autopsy photos and x-rays. That's a decision they made out of deference to the wishes of the Kennedy family. Uh, but had they had forensic pathologists look at those autopsy photos and x-rays, the Warren Commission report would have been much, much better in terms of a good description uh, of the wounds. That was their biggest blunder. So with that, I fear we have to move on. You will understand, I'm sure, since time is short and there are a number of listeners still lined up. 312-591-7200, the number, and Robert is the next caller. Good evening. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make a comment here that uh, Dr. McAdams uh, uh, is, uh, reminds me a little bit of the amazing Randy in that he, he, he's a debunker. Exactly. And... Uh, so that he proceeds from a premise uh, that will determine his uh, 
I guess is would in logic would be postulates, uh, that his investigation is going to be determined from a, from his initial premise that uh, there is a, uh, is that the uh, conspiracy uh, theories uh, tend to be products of uh, delusional uh, delusions. And so he couldn't accept an idea of a conspiracy that might be based on a, on a paranoid delusion. Well, hold on a minute. Uh, certainly uh, you would agree that a conspiracy was involved in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, of course there was, because there's, there's good evidence of it. Uh, one piece of evidence was another conspirator attacked, uh, I think it was Secretary of State Seward, Seward exactly. cut him up pretty yeah. badly, uh, didn't uh, kill him. So there was, in fact, pretty solid evidence of, uh, of, uh, of a conspiracy there. Uh, you know, as for starting with a particular postulate, um, I, if you, there simply is a lot of conspiracy stuff uh, that can be debunked because it is it is bogus, um, and you know you need to debunk that. As I always tell my students, um, it's conceivable that there was a conspiracy, but that the conspirators lucked out because so much silly stuff. Uh, claiming a conspiracy uh, was uh, heaped on the whole subject by uh, witnesses who were making up tall tales by conspiracy authors who concocted uh, nonsensical uh, nonsensical theories. Um, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, but the simple fact is, I mean, look at it issue by issue. Was Roger Craig reliable when he said uh, 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 7.65 Manica Carcano was recovered in the depository? That's what he told Lincoln Carl in an interview in 1974. In 1968, he told uh, the Los Angeles Free Press something different. He said he had heard uh, that a Mauser was recovered on the roof. He changed his story. It got much better. That is a fact. That doesn't start from a postulate that there was no conspiracy. That starts from asking about the consistency of Roger Craig's testimony. That's known uh, as evidence. Sir, we thank you for the call, <clears throat> and we'll go quickly to another. On 312-591-7200, here's Richard. Good evening. Yes, good evening. I was uh, wondering about the uh, supposed uh, withholding of parts of the Warren Commission uh, reports until the year 2013 or 2017, if that's if that in fact is true, and mm. what the professor professor would feel is the reason for that being withheld. That's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, n number one, uh, in the 1990s, there was something called the Assassination Records Review Board. And their job was to obtain all assassination-related records from agencies, including the FBI and the CIA, but including other agencies like, for example, Naval um, Intelligence. Uh, and uh, all those records were supposed to be released unless the uh, ARRB, which consisted essentially of uh, historians and archivists, archivists or a variety of librarians, agreed that particular information uh, needed to be withheld. So a massive number of records were released in the 1990s. Now, that doesn't preclude some conspiracy <coughs> theorists saying there are other records that ought to be released. The most famous case now is a guy named Jefferson Morley, who wants the records uh, released on a guy named George Joannidis, uh, who uh, was a CIA guy in Miami. Um, it's important to understand that government often is secret in ways that don't make any sense. Uh, a few years ago, uh, um, 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 an organization called the James Madison Project asked uh, the National Archives what was the oldest record they had that was still classified. The archives came up with, I believe it was four documents from World War I that dealt with secret writing. You know, you write something and then you hold it over a candle and you can read it, stuff like that. Um, instead of releasing those documents, they went to the CIA and asked the CIA, because although it didn't exist in World War I, it was the agency most concerned with that, should they release those documents? The CIA said no. <laughs> they said, hey, it might help terrorists. Okay, how do you explain the CIA wanting... World War I documents to be withheld. I think the simple explanation is that government bureaucrats have an often irrational attachment to secrecy. 
they are terribly, terribly risk averse and never really heavily weigh the public's right to know uh, against their concern that something, uh, you know, uh, might slip out that would endanger national security or would uh, burn a source or, or something like that. But there really is a big record of just irrational uh, secrecy on the part of government agencies in ways that, you know, have nothing to do with any, any conspiracy. There's no secret writing conspiracy. Our thanks to that caller, and we'll work on the last one as we go quickly. Here is John. You're on the air, sir. Please go ahead, but rather briefly. Hello. Uh, just as an aside, uh, the Warren Commission conclusion stand or fall in the single bullet theory, and I think we'd all agree that no one is more expert in the single bullet theory than John Connolly, the man who was struck by it and lived and maintained till the day he died it was a fiction. But what I wanted to talk about was Karen Bennett Carlin, the girl to whom Jack uh, Ruby was to wire the money at the Western Union office who gave him his alibi for being there. Uh, she was taken into custody the next day, questioned by the Secret Service, and she became hysterical when she was interrogated about her role in the affairs of that weekend. Uh, she maintained that she wouldn't answer any questions till they brought her husband in to settle her down. And she maintained that there was a, a conspiracy of which she didn't claim to know the details, but she claimed that Ruby was part of the assassination. Uh, I've got to stop you right now because time is almost up. But okay, you know what thanks. that suggests to me is that despite all your efforts, this is, uh, which are, uh, you've yeah, done yeah. them in an indefatigable uh, way, but you're never going to persuade <laughs> true conspiracy. Uh, probably not. I don't see how Karen Carlin could have known of any conspiracy. She'd have to be part of it. She was a stripper, for heaven's sakes. What role did she play in the conspiracy? I mean, There's a whole community out there who resists oh, sure. Uh, oh, sure. reducing this to just happenstance. Sure, sure. There? Uh, sure. Yeah. In, in, true, in other words, true believers. Well, uh, you know, in, 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 indeed there are. And um, um, okay. I mean, look, I'm not in the business of trying to persuade everybody. I can say what I think the truth is, and mm -hmm. some people buy it, some people don't. And I've long ago given up the idea that I can persuade everybody. Are, con uh, are conspiracy enthusiasts organized in their own groups, or their own websites, or, et cetera, et cetera? Oh, sure. Uh, there are consp plenty of conspiracy-oriented uh, websites. Some of them are pretty good websites. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I think they're misguided, but they have good information. The JFK Lancer website, Mary Farrell Archive, is very good. Well, for excellent information, you must get your hands, if you care about these matters, as lots of people obviously do, you must get your hands on the new book by John McAdams, JFK Assassination Logic.